What is the plane of the future? Well, there's many ideas and concept designs that try to visualize this futuristic plane. But in terms of functionality, features, and how it will actually work, I couldn't find any concrete answers. So that's what I set out to do. But in order to do that, I had to find the answer to three critical questions that I believe are the most essential questions we need answering to, to figure out what the plane of the future is. They are the following. What fuel will this plane use? Will it go supersonic? And will it be autonomous? But in addition to answering these questions, I will, at some point in this video, go through a secret plane concept that until now has not been understood or decoded. Also, only a small percentage of people who watch my videos are actually subscribed. So, if you end up liking this video, consider subscribing, it's free, and you can always change your mind. Chapter 1 Fuel Source The first and most critical part of the plane of the future is its fuel source. You see, planes will have to transition to using sustainable fuels eventually. It doesn't matter if you believe in climate change or not, planes along with all other modes of transportation will have to make this transition because fossil fuels will not last forever. And it doesn't matter if we run out of fossil fuels in 50, 100 or 1000 years. The fact is, we have to transition at some point. So it's better to start now rather than later. So what fuel sources do we have available that are sustainable and which one of these is the most likely to be chosen for widespread adoption? Well, the first fuel source we need to touch on is hydrogen, which is the fuel source that Airbus is betting on. Now, hydrogen doesn't really make that much sense as a fuel source in any mode of transportation, including planes. The reason for this is that hydrogen has too many disadvantages associated with it. The first and most apparent disadvantage of hydrogen is not the fuel itself, but the infrastructure needed for it to work. You see, hydrogen is very different from kerosene, which is the fuel we use in planes today in a few key ways. First is the fact that hydrogen in its liquid form is very, very cold and would require a whole new infrastructure to be built for us to be able to transport, store and fuel our planes with it. And this infrastructure would have to be implemented on a global scale before any aircraft could go into service, meaning that a giant upfront investment would have to be made in all airports globally for this to happen. This would obviously cost a lot of money for the airports around the world, and for this reason it is very unlikely that any airport would agree to this, and especially the smaller ones. Airbus even states they will have to have global agreements from all major airports for hydrogen to even start to become a feasible solution. And Airbus knows it's very unlikely that this will ever happen, which could explain their very unambitious timelines. Another thing about hydrogen is that if you want it to be produced sustainably, it will cost you around 3 to 6 dollars per kilogram where kerosene on the other hand only costs 87 cents per kilogram, which, to say it mildly, is not something the airlines would be too happy about, considering fuel costs already represent a large size of their balance sheets. Now sure, Airbus expects these prices to fall by around 30% by the year 2030, but that's not nearly enough. It doesn't take a PhD in mathematics to figure out that even with the price cuts, we still have a massive discrepancy here. But there is actually one more reason why hydrogen won't work, and that reason is safety. You see, when hydrogen is in its gaseous form, it becomes highly reactive to oxygen. Meaning, if just a tiny bit of oxygen came in contact with the hydrogen, it would annihilate the entire aircraft as well as the airport it would be sitting in if enough hydrogen was present. So to recap, not only does hydrogen make very little economic sense, it also poses massive safety risks, and I know very few people that would agree to sit on top of a literal bomb. So what other fuel sources could we use? Well, this is where it begins to get pretty interesting, because it's quite likely that we will see the aviation industry make use of two fuel sources rather than one. And these fuel sources are biofuels and battery electric. But why is it that we will see both being used and not just one of them? Well, it's because these two fuel sources complement each other quite nicely. The reason behind this is that a battery electric plane will have a very low cost to operate, making it great at short haul flights, which are flights lasting up to around 3 hours. And the biofuel plane will be perfect for medium to long haul flights because of the energy density of biofuels. But the reason why battery electric planes are cheaper to operate 
is because electricity is cheaper than both biofuels and kerosene, making battery electric planes available for airlines on routes that match the distance of an electric plane. And when you add a low maintenance cost to that, it really starts to get attractive for the airlines. But the thing about batteries is that the energy densities of them is not high enough to allow for medium and long haul flights, at least with current technology which is why we need biofuels as well. You see, the best batteries we have today have energy densities of around 350 to 370 watt hours per kilogram, which for someone unfamiliar with the matter doesn't mean much, but putting it in a comparison with kerosene and biofuels, you can see it lags behind quite a bit. The reason this matters is because the lower the energy density the fuel you carry has, the more of that fuel you need to have with you, which creates a new problem, since the extra fuel you have to carry adds weight, increasing the fuel you need again. I think you get the idea, but it means that a battery electric plane is heavily reliant on energy densities of batteries to improve for it to become viable on longer routes. But as time moves on and battery production increases and the batteries receive higher energy densities as well as lower costs, it could enable medium haul and maybe even long haul flights to become viable. Which might not be too far away, but I'll get more into detail about that later in the video where I will go through the secret plane concept that I've been talking about. But until then, biofuel powered planes will make for a great substitute as no new infrastructure is required considering it functions the exact same way as kerosene, which is a dream come true for airports. Chapter 2 Speed Typically, a commercial airline flying today will have a cruising speed between 880 and 920 km an hour. The reason they fly at these speeds are because of drag. You see, the closer you get to Mach 1, also known as the speed of sound, the more drag you impose on the aircraft, significantly reducing efficiency, which ultimately cuts down the range of the airplane quite significantly. This is why all planes fly either below or significantly above the speed of sound. But you might have noticed that we don't have any commercial airplanes flying at supersonic speeds. Which is odd, considering just 20 years ago, we did. Back then we had Concorde that had cruising speeds of around Mach 2 or 2150 km an hour. But as you might know, Concorde got retired, and it did so in 2003, which according to Air France and British Airways, it was mostly because of economic reasons, as maintenance costs kept rising for these old planes. And considering it was a 40-year-old aircraft at the time, it does make sense. Although the final blow for Concorde didn't come in 2003, instead it came a few years earlier than that, in the year 2000 where an Air France Concorde crashed only minutes after it took off in Paris, killing all 109 people on board and 4 people on the ground. But this crash was not the result of Concorde failing to do what it was supposed to do. You see, the cause of the crash was actually a piece of metal left on the runway, which was discovered too late as ticket sales for Concorde began steadily decreasing after the crash until it eventually got retired in 2003. But maybe it's time to bring back supersonic flights as the public's fear for flying supersonic has mostly vanished and the interest in it has been steadily increasing. And technology has advanced dramatically since the Concorde was first introduced in the late 60s, meaning fuel costs and maintenance costs can be reduced significantly, which makes it economically viable. Interestingly, we actually have a company working on bringing back commercial supersonic travel, and that company is called Boom Supersonics. This company is building a supersonic aircraft that they say will fly on 100% sustainable fuels when it enters the commercial aviation industry in 2029, which is very exciting as this plane checks off multiple boxes, making it a perfect match for the plane of the future. Now sure, 2029 seems pretty far away, but it is around the same time that Airbus and Boeing will be coming out with their sustainably powered planes. So that seems to be the time we should expect the next era of airplanes to enter service. But there is a big difference between Airbus, Boeing and Boom Supersonics. Because Boeing and Airbus have the advantage of having planes that are already approved by the FAA, meaning they can take existing planes and retrofit them with new technologies such as biofuels and hydrogen. This is an advantage for multiple reasons. Not only will they have lower research and development spending, but they will also be able to get their plane certified in 3 to 4 years, where an entirely new plane like the one Boom is building will take 5 to 9 years to get certified. So it's not really Boom's fault that we will have to 
to wait 8 years for their supersonic aircraft, but when it comes to Boeing and Airbus, they don't really have an excuse for it to take that long. It almost seems like they don't really care about sustainability and it's just this annoying trend they will have to deal with at some point. So they just make these really unambitious timelines and push it to the side until they actually have to do something about it. Or maybe Boom Supersonics are just overly optimistic about their timelines. I guess only time will tell, but if that is what Boeing and Airbus is doing, it simply won't work. I mean, we've seen that in the automotive industry already, where traditional automakers get completely steamrolled by new companies and new technologies. And to say it mildly, it's not going well for the traditional automakers right now. Furthermore, Boeing and Airbus don't have any plans to create a commercial supersonic aircraft at all. And considering that's what we're looking for, the plane of the future might not even be made by them. It will probably be made by a new company like Boom Supersonics instead. Boom is such an interesting company and if they have just the slightest chance of bringing back commercial supersonic planes, I will be rooting for them and I think you should too. Although there is one massive flaw with Boom's plane that would have to be taken care of before we could consider this plane as the plane of the future. Chapter 3 Autonomy Artificial intelligence has shown to be immensely useful in a number of different applications and the number of tasks that AI is better at than humans increases every single day. So will AI be replacing pilots in the future or will a computer never be able to replace a pilot's judgment and skills? Well humans aren't perfect and pilot error actually accounted for 57% of all fatal accidents in planes over the last decade, which is by far the largest cause for fatal accidents. And eliminating those accidents would obviously be preferred, but to do that we still need to get rid of the pilots, which might actually be easier than you might think. You see, on a regular flight, the autopilot already does around 90% of the flying, where pilots usually just handle the landing, although modern airplanes don't actually require the pilot to take over on the landings either. In fact, when conditions get too difficult for pilots to handle, such as in foggy conditions, the autopilot does the landing for them. So the technology already exists today, but there's more reasons why we won't have pilots in the future. You see, there's a huge pilot shortage in the world right now that will continue to rise over the next few decades as air travel increases in popularity. This means that we will need around 800,000 pilots by the year 2040, according to Boeing CEO. So either we force a bunch of unqualified people to become pilots or we could go the safer and cheaper route, which is using AI. The benefits for using AI are simply too great to ignore. And I would have no doubt in my mind that if airlines were allowed to fly without a pilot, they would do so in an instant. And if passengers were guaranteed a safer flight, I believe they would choose the AI as well. So not only will airlines have fewer accidents and save a bunch of money on pilot salaries, they will also be able to put in more seats in the planes, increasing revenues and making it easier for them to turn a profit. But the only thing holding this back is regulations. But these regulations will soon have to change in order to keep up with the changing times. As we already know, we won't have enough pilots to fly the planes in the future. But I think the first catalyst for this will be self-driving cars. And once we are comfortable with being driven around by an artificial intelligence, the next natural step would be airplanes. And while that might be hard to wrap your head around, it seems that the plane of the future will be flown by artificial intelligence and not a human. Chapter 4. The Secret Plane Concept Okay, so it's time to talk about the secret plane I mentioned earlier in the video. And honestly, this plane concept might very well become the plane of the future. You see, this aircraft will be an electric, supersonic, VTOL jet that is also fully autonomous. And normally, those words should not be able to describe a single plane. But in this instance, they are. And you've probably heard of the guy who is behind this concept. His name is Elon Musk, and Elon has been talking about this idea for over a decade now, first being mentioned in the second Iron Man movie that was released in 2010. Since then, he has mentioned the idea several times on Twitter, but never has he shared the details that would make such an aircraft possible. But I believe I might have discovered a way this could actually work. So first, let's talk about the supersonic part of this aircraft. Ordinarily, fast planes use jet engines for propulsion. 
You see, their compressor stages operate at subsonic speeds, so all supersonic jets have complex intake systems designed to decelerate in rushing air prior to impacting the turbine for it to work. Electric propellers, however, have no such constraints, making it way easier to build an electric aircraft capable of supersonic speeds. And I would have left the supersonic part of this aircraft at that, but many people worry that propellers can't operate at supersonic speeds as they will be torn to pieces, which is a misconception that we need to debunk. Because it turns out that the tips of high bypass turbofans exceed the sound barrier during takeoff, and at more extreme levels, the TU-95 actually operates with supersonic propellers explaining its unusually high cruising speed. So we already have propellers spinning at supersonic speeds, and it really shouldn't be such a mystery that a propeller driven by an electric motor can exceed the sound barrier. But what about power? How are we going to propel this aircraft to supersonic speeds? Well, I found a calculation made by a guy named Casey Handmer, and he states that we would need 8 electric motors weighing in at 400 kilograms each to propel us to supersonic speeds. This is assuming the aircraft has a maximum takeoff weight of around 13 metric tons, meaning that everything to do with the propulsion system of this aircraft will work. Although we still need to talk about the vertical takeoff and landing system that this aircraft will supposedly have. But that's actually the simplest part of this plane to explain. As electric motors, unlike jet engines, work brilliantly at all speeds, so you would basically only need to have a few gimbals to direct the propellers at the ground during takeoff and landings to receive lift. But the best thing about the plane being VTOL is the fact that we don't need large, draggy wings like we saw on the Concorde, making the plane look a lot more like a rocket and vastly more efficient. But as you might have guessed, I saved the best for last, and that is batteries. Now, Elon states that in order for this plane to be viable, we need batteries with energy densities of at least 400 watt hours per kilogram. And according to Casey Handmer's calculations, we could, with battery energy densities of around 500 watt hours per kilogram, be able to go 1200 kilometers. Meaning that Elon's plane would likely be targeting a 1000 kilometer range. Although there is one flaw in Handmer's calculations, which he does note himself, and that is he didn't account for the electric motor's ability to fly at extreme altitudes, meaning it's very likely that Elon's plane will take advantage of the thinner air you find higher in the atmosphere to fly further with the same amount of energy. Okay, so this plane is starting to sound pretty ridiculous. So when are we actually going to see it? Well, we know that we will have the batteries needed in two to three years, but we also know that it takes around five to nine years to get a whole new aircraft certified by the FAA. Meaning that if Elon has a plane ready in two years, which is very unlikely, it would take at least another five years to get it certified. Meaning we will have to wait till 2028 at the earliest before it hits the skies. But I think the main takeaway should be that it's definitely possible to make this plane and considering that the energy density of batteries increased by 5% annually, we should actually expect to see batteries with around 520 watt hours per kilogram being available in 2028, making even longer flights with this plane possible. Although that is of course assuming no battery breakthroughs, which is something that is very likely to happen in that time frame. So the actual batteries might be a little crazier than what we might expect, but still, Elon's plane won't be replacing medium to long haul flights anytime soon. So it's great that we have companies like Boom Supersonics trying to figure out other ways to make sustainable supersonic flights possible. And it makes me excited to see so many talented people working on the next generation of commercial aircraft. It will be exciting to see how it actually turns out and how wrong I was about it. But that's it for this video. Also, I made a Patreon, so if you want to support the channel directly, go to the link in the description and sign up today. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.